And while she gets herself set up, uh, I'm gonna say uh, welcome. So welcome everybody to this uh, latest installment of the AG Webinars Professional Development Series uh, featuring Shelly Stahl, Director of Data Programs here at AGU. Uh, my name is Nathaniel Janik. I'm the Career Services Coordinator here at AGU and I'll be our host for today's webinar titled Data Management Fundamentals. Uh, some of you have already joined earlier, so you've used this question box already, um, but I just wanna go over some of these tools that we'll be using. Uh, so there is the question box. Uh, at any time during the presentation, go ahead and if you have a question, type it in that question box. If we don't get to it, like if it makes sense to cover it while we're on that particular slide, we'll try to. Um, otherwise, we'll be holding the questions until the very end of the presentation. Um, we also have a hand raising function. Uh, if everybody can try in their control panel to raise your hand, if you can find it, uh, looks like some of you have. Uh, and so, yeah, so we may have a few times during the presentation where it's a, a yes, no question. So we're gonna get you to participate by raising your hand in those situations. Um, also, uh, we have some handouts. Uh, the two handouts that are in the control panel, you'll see in that handouts tab, we have today's slides, as well as a handout that contains the references and URLs that you will find throughout this presentation. That way uh, you have it all ready to go. Um, and uh, Shelly, before I pass it back over to you, uh, I just want to note that uh, if you could try to, I'm going to, I'm going to make you the presenter again, uh, but you are presently, oh, you know what you want to do? Go to the show screen and pick screen clean. Right now it's showing your, uh, your drawer at the bottom or whatever that's called on a Mac. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And I just hit something that I honestly wasn't sure what it did. I'm, I'm not sure how to do what you just said. Try again. Okay. All right. Um, so I haven't used it on a Mac in a while, but you should. I'll tell you what. Let me. Oh, there. Oh, there. It's, it's going. There. There. Okay. there. That did it. All right. Perfect. Okay. Uh, okay. Gotcha. It'll pop up. It'll be fine. <laughs> um, okay. All right. All right. Well, anyways, without further ado, now that we have that little technical glitch figured out, uh, I'm going to uh, pass it over to you, Shelley. Go ahead. and. Oh, fantastic. Play. Thank you, Nathaniel. Oh, it was a lot of fun to play um, the bingo game. So uh, hopefully you guys had a good time. Um, when, uh, one of the things that I have, I, I really enjoy doing is coming to a lot of our meetings and having a chance to talk to student groups about data management. It's a, it's an area that we, don't focus on until later, and then you there's some surprises that come. And this uh, fundamentals talk is going to try to give you awareness of what will be, what will matter now, and what will matter later. So let's get into it. Um, so we'll we'll talk about uh, why management, why sharing for data, uh, what are those uh, uh, guiding principles for fair, what is fair, uh, what is a data man. Um, what does discovery mean? What does citation mean? And then provide you with some uh, resources such as COPDES, uh, which is the Coalition on Publishing Data in the Earth and Space Sciences. So we're, we'll just touch on a lot of this. Um, there's so much more to dig into, um, but for now we'll hit some of the basic fundamentals. So um, for data management and data, man and data sharing, um, I'm gonna try to introduce to you why this is important by telling you um, a story. So we'll start with um, you as a researcher. Uh, what you would be interested in when it comes to data is that you would have access through publications that were interesting to you uh, to a data citation where you could actually pull the data down and and kind of play with it and see and see what it's all about. Similarly for software, um, data you would you would be have the ability to do that because it's accessible. It would be in a format that worked with your tools, and you would understand that you could reuse this data based on the license that's provided by the repository. So so to give you a reason why we have this in four sections, we're talking about this concept of fair, F A I R, findable, accessible interoperable and reusable. And there's more to it, but this is this is the basics. Um, 
And that's what would be valuable to you as a researcher. So let me tell you about Dr. Brewer. Dr. Brewer is our editor-in-chief here at AGU's Oceans Journal, and he just recently published a NEOS article this last fall that is just a fantastic experience on his part um, as to what, uh, why data sharing, why making your data available is really important, um, especially when you don't know how it could possibly be reused in the future, and you also want your research to be well understood by others. Um, so. Uh, and to kind of lead into that, um, one of the reasons he wrote the article had to do with the uh, AGU's position statement on data, uh, the Earth and Space Sciences data is a world heritage. This, this document is really interesting and gives you an idea of what our board, our leadership has in front of us when we make decisions. We include this position statement on data when we make decisions at AGU. Um, and you can take a look at it. it's a couple pages long this is actually just the very very beginning um, but data needs to be well documented and preserved into the future uh, data is valuable to you long after your research um, say if you want to come back later um, you know unless you had it well documented when you finished uh, you might not remember uh, exactly what your own data was so do, taking the time to make it um, uh, you know, everything that's necessary for even you to remember is also is very valuable. And our publication data policy, this is, um, has been updated most recently in 2016, um, is uh, it's really important that you provide with your publication the data necessary to understand, and you can read the rest of this, um, and uh, it has to be made available whenever possible. And uh, um, uh, by request to the author is no is not acceptable. We we no longer allow that at AGU. So that leads us into Dr. Brewer's um, article in EOS. So one of the things he observes within the article is that that new policy I just showed you, um, there was more commentary on that than any other uh, change he's ever experienced. So he knows that we're all focused on what that means within our research. So he highlights that here. And um, he recently participated in uh, the Royal Society's discussion on ocean ventilation and deoxygenation. You can see that. And one of his contributions to this was to write an article um, using data from multiple sources. Um, and he actually, and, and many of these people, it says here, are his friends, his colleagues. Uh, and there was at no time for any of those articles did anyone ever say to him, sure, I'm happy to do that. He ran into roadblock after roadblock, you can see what's highlighted here, and was horrified that his own community was having trouble sharing data and then even, even when asked, did not produce. So let me, let me go into this a little bit more. So for instance, take a look at this uh, picture on the left-hand side and you'll see this vertical red line um, completely orthogonal, as he says, to all of the other data points that were collected. Now, you and I would go, well, you know, that just looks like you got your X and Y axis mixed up. But he had no way to validate that. The, um, the corresponding author, his friend, had uh, very, very poor eyesight at this point, couldn't even, um, you know, validate that this issue actually existed. And the student that was helping with the data was no longer contactable. This, these are human things that happen to us, and this is one of the primary reasons that getting your data into a, a repository that preserves it is really important. Um, and one other example he shared in an email, when I, I told him I was going to share um, his article with you, and he said, please let them know that there's even more horrific things that can happen. One of the authors he tried to reach uh, ended up having died tragically and there was no way for him to get the data from the paper. And, and these are things that can happen to us and we just have to realize the value of our data and it needs to be in a repository. So, and he goes on to say, don't give me the aggregated numbers. Give me, the, give me all of the detail I need to understand the visualizations, understand the graphs, be able to recreate what, what's happening there. So it's not just lumped numbers. This is really important as well. And he said this incredibly sobering experience. He had a full-blown difficulty with every single paper he tried to get data from. And he's like, we, we just can't let this happen. Going forward, we have to make sure our data is in repositories that are open and accessible as much as possible. So um, uh, Nathaniel, this is a really good time to bring up our poll. 
All right, yeah, and um, here's the first poll that we have. How would you describe your own experience with uh, other people's data and your research? Uh, and you can select any that apply here. Uh, I only create data and never reuse it. I've always been able to access the data that I need. I've had trouble accessing data just the way that uh, Peter Brewer describes. Uh, what do you mean I might have trouble finding data? Or lastly, it can be a real headache. Um, so I'm going to give everyone a few more moments to uh, make their selections and submit their votes. And I'm going to close the poll in five, four, three, two, and one. All right. And here are the results. It looks like uh, 2%, only 2% say that they only create data and never reuse it. Others. 16% uh, say they've always been able to find the access uh, to the data that they need, uh, while 55% say that they've had trouble accessing data just like Peter Brewer, and 37% nearly half say that uh, using other people's data with their research can be a real headache. This is quite something, right? Um, we're all challenged. So let, let's do better. Let's, let's be able to document and share our data better. So let's talk about that. Uh, here we go. So um, fair guiding principles. Uh, I'll give you a, a very light touch on this and an opportunity for you to dig in more on your own. Um, we have stickers. So if you, when you come to fall meeting or when you see me, I have stickers I can give you. Here is our findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So um, uh, take a look at the Nature paper that was written by um, uh, Dr. Wilkerson and uh, quite a lot of other folks within many, many communities that had weighed in. Um, and um, uh, and so as a so to put that into context, what does that mean for you as a researcher contributing to the scientific record and trying to make your data fair? So let's kind of walk through this a little bit. And I'll even give you the, the FAIR so that you can kind of see how that orients. So that means that you have your data um, within your publication identified in a citation. Um, that uh, in any of, of your other research products as best you can. Um, not all of the other research products have good citation uh, practices just yet, but best you can. Um, and because of that, you'll be able to actually have um, really good credit opportunity to connect that work to yourself. Um, and this is true also for your software. So, and one of the ways that you can do this and get the most help is by selecting a repository um, where you can actually, uh, there's a data manager, there's data curation support. Not all domains have these repositories, but where you have them, please use them. And uh, they'll help you make sure that the data is in a format. And you, you probably already know what your formats are for your domain, but they'll help you make sure that it's in common, re, uh, uh, interoperable, reusable format. And then you're, you're um, documenting that data well for people to understand. Um, and the folks that are doing data curation with you can help you understand what that means, how deep to go, um, and that you're providing a license that's clear uh, for how people can reuse your data. So I'm going to tease out just one piece of this, and I'm giving it to you as a homework assignment. So one of the uh, infrastructure pieces for credit, so things having to do with not just your publication, but with also your data and other research products, has to do with connecting that to your individual uh, unique identifier. So we call that the ORCID. Um, I'm going to assume that the bulk of you haven't yet gotten an ORCID. I did see that on our bingo that we had at least one person. So your job today, and don't let this go, put this at the top of your list. It does not take long to set up. You can refine your profile over time, but you, you want to get your number so that you can put it on every publication, every oral presentation, every poster that you create, every article that you write, the letter to your mother that you plan to write tomorrow. Put your ORCID on there. I'm kidding about the letter. Um, but make sure that this is something that you are constantly pushing out in front of everyone. Um, it is uh, uh, this particular not-for-profit organization, um, this is their goal is to make sure that you have access, uh, easy access to everything that's been generated. 
And the behind the scenes that happens is the this organization is connected to repositories and journals and Crossref such that as these citations are generated and your ORCID is associated, these connections are made. Now, in some cases, these entities are still building this structure, but if you've got that ORCID, you can go ahead and, and, and take advantage of what exists and what will exist in the future. So there's your homework assignment. Okay, fantastic. Ah, the fair guiding principles. I think you have our next question, Nathaniel. Yes, um, so uh, what I wanted to ask is, everybody who's here, and this is where this hand raising function comes into play, uh, raise your hand if you have heard of FAIR, F-A-I-R, before this webinar. All right, looks like uh, starting to see some responses here. Uh, and it's ticking up. It looks like uh, it, it's it's slowing down at about 19 uh, percent. Pretty so new. Yeah. Pretty new. Um, and and that, that I guess that's not really a surprise because FAIR has been targeted towards um, more of the informatics community on what it means to prepare so that researchers can then have as much support as possible in order to create a FAIR fair data, fair software, um, uh, things that are findable. So that that probably makes sense, but I think now you know how you play a role here. Um, so let's move on to data management plans. Um, these pictures are just so much fun. I'm glad I can share them with you. Um, data management plans, commonly you don't quite realize that this is gonna be a requirement for your research until you get to your first research opportunity. Um, and these are, these are documents that are required um, by funders, um, sometimes government entities as well who do funding, and they can be two pages or more. Um, and they, what they do is they, uh, uh, they help you refine and explain to the funder uh, the kind of data that you're gonna create, how you're gonna treat it during the project, and what's gonna happen. So I, I wanna give credit to um, Bill Mishner, who wrote this really fantastic article in PLOS's Computational Biology, describing, and I'm using his content here for these slides, so I, I really want you to go look at his entire article, um, and it, it's in the um, one of the handouts that Nathaniel prepared for you. You can get the link to it, um, and keep it handy, because it will always remind you the kinds of things you're thinking about when you're trying to populate a data management plan. Data management plans are living things. This is like your CV. This is like things that you update all the time. Um, you know more as your research uh, progresses, so you wanna update your plan with what you know. Um, if there's one thing you take out of this conversation on data management plans is please don't create it and put it away and never look at it. it that won't help you. You're gonna need to actually pay attention to how you care for your data. So should we be talking about the full data lifecycle description, and these are these are things that Bill has identified everywhere from you know what's out there, um, actually finding other people's data, creating your own data, the collection, how you're going to organize it, what sort of quality control are you going to have? How do you know that when you typed it in from your field notes that you actually got it right? How are you double checking? Um, how are you documenting? This is important for your metadata. Uh, what sort of methods are you using? What sort of instrumentation? Um, uh, then how will that data be used? This is, this is actually really important, especially for others trying to understand your work. What is the purpose, uh, best purpose for this data? And then how will you preserve it? And what, and what I mean by that is you want to actually have others care for your data into the future. You want to move on to other research. So you want it to be, live it at a repository that understands the kind of data that you, that you have. Um, and then uh, the plans for sharing with others. Of course, you're going to share this. That's why you're here. Um, and let me move on. So this is a diagram that Bill provides, and it's really fantastic because it shows the process of research at the top, that's A, and then the data process in the bottom and the touch points between the two. Um, so I highlighted data citation there just because as part of publication, you would want to cite your data. But um, but the plan and um, how you share your data actually have these touch points. So um, so so is the number two having to do with uh, getting and acquiring data for your research. This is where your data management plan comes in. Well, how are you going to actually do that? Um, and those yellow numbers they are aligned to the the recommendations he's giving in the document. So let me show you what those recommendations are. 
I'm, I'm not going to read them all to you. Um, I want you to go and take a look at this article, but um, no, let's just to touch on the first one there, uh, the person who's funding you, uh, your institution, um, uh, any uh, government regulations that must apply, your country regulations that must apply, all of those weigh in on what you're going to be able to do and how you store your data. It can be a little complicated. Um, and, uh, you know, reaching out to a data repository to get their advice, especially um, uh, uh, especially when it comes to um, best places to put your data, best places to document it, getting help from other repositories can help you build your plan. Uh, let me move here on to the next five. Um, your preservation strategy into the future, really important. Um, and let's see, I, I think I'll leave it at there. Um, there are two tools that are really helpful that a lot of funders, uh, the, the requirements for a lot of funders are built into, it can help you navigate. Um, now we have an international community, so these two tools actually have the same code base, which is lovely. They've worked very closely together. Um, the DMP tool, primarily US-based, so that's out of the California Digital Library, and then the DMP Online is out of the UK at the Digital Curation Center. Both teams are fantastic and they work well together. And so if you haven't yet uh, you, uh, been introduced to this, these are two really good tools to help you identify all of the things that you need. Uh, so let's talk about what it means to actually prepare for discovery, finding data, how you choose repositories, and what citation means. And you know, these are all kind of mashed together. Um, so again, remember, we're talking, uh, you know, how does this orient with FAIR? And mostly this piece is the F part. So what, how do you actually find and prepare to find data? What, you know, you've got a couple roles here. You're actually hunting um, and you are actually populating with your own data. So, um, and this is where your relationship with a repository helps. This is where people can actually give you a hand. And the kind of repository you're looking for, and I'll, I'll give you a tool for this as well, um, is one that supports data citation, one that supports persistent identifiers. Um, they know what the community formats are. They know how to help you with the documentation and metadata about, your, about the data you've created. They know how to guide you on licensing, how to make the selection. Um, and that they have built into their system a way to make your data easy to find. And you want it to be easy to find because uh, unbeknownst to you, we've got transdisciplinary work and work in other fields that uh, if they were able to find your data, not through a publication, but through a repository, the ability to actually use it for other purposes that you can't yet under can't yet think into the future, maybe long after your career is ended, um, will be valuable to science going forward. So, so this is really um, uh, important to find a good repository for this. Uh, all right, so moving along. Um, so I hope this is funny to you and I hope it's not new information, but that thumb drive that you've got in your bag, this is not what we call an archive. This is not a repository. This is a temporary device. Your thumb drive is going to fail. I can guarantee you that it is going to fail. So don't think, please don't think that anything you put here is going to be preserved in any way, shape, or form. So now that I've said that, you don't want your data just to be on your laptop. You don't want your data just to be on a thumb drive. Um, we don't want to put it in a supplement that's undiscoverable by other disciplines. Um, yes, data is discoverable and commonly so through the publication, but our science is getting more complex and it's harder and harder for people to actually navigate through the volume of work. Um, and it would be much easier if we can if we can use repositories and the search criteria that they provide to help help others find your data. And it's not just your data, you really do need the documentation. You need um, how did it get created, what's the provenance, any transformation, any synthesis that took place. So how can, how can you find these repositories? So here are three tools. Um, most of our Earth, Space, and Environmental repositories are going to be found in RE3 data or COPDES. 
Um, Coptis actually has a list, um, uh, which is a slightly different version of RE3 data, but RE3 data has probably the more robust list. Um, and fair sharing is coming along. Um, they actually have a really neat set of tools, mostly bio-oriented, uh, but just keep an eye on them. That, that will be useful to you in the future as they expand beyond the bio community. Um, so these are your tools right now. I will tell you that um, there is a new tool coming in August uh, that DataCite and RE3 Data have teamed together with um, in, uh, to provide you with more of a uh, like a, a, a like a decision tree to figure out okay I'm in this country I have this kind of data this is my funder this is my institution what repository works for me and we're really excited about that DataCite is building that. Um, as part of a different effort, and it's going to be available for the Earth, Space, and Environmental Sciences in August. So, so watch for that to come out in a big way. Um, but meanwhile, here's, here's what we got right now. Um, so Coptis is going to have some um, materials for you to understand how publishers think about data citation. What is it that I'm citing? Um, first of all, uh, you want to look at um, anything you're reusing so that you can give credit to the folks that actually created it. So that's the, the first one there, um, something that's already out there, something that's already published, and then anything that you're creating new so that others can find it and then give you credit for any reuse. Um, so that link, you can start with coptis.org and, and play around in that space and that, will, that, that information is there. Um, so uh, another fantastic, um, uh, valuable location is uh, ESIP, ESIPFed.org, and I gave you a bit.ly here um, to navigate directly to their data citation uh, guidelines. These are written for researchers and show you exactly um, what it means to cite your data, different examples within Earth, Space, and Environmental Science. And right here, I'm just listing for you what the elements are um, uh, in case it's not familiar to you. Um, and it's a community that if you'd had a question, um, they are there to help answer it. Um, if you if you need, if you don't see the example that you're looking for, they are an active community that uh, is willing and ready to give a hand and help out. Um, uh, within AGU's journals, we put our data availability statement in the acknowledgement section. Other journals, it might be in different locations, but there is a data availability statement. And what you want to do here, you know, you know, why do I need this and a data citation? Well, first of all, it, this is kind of like your check check within your publication. Did I account for every single data set that supports my research? Do I have it here, and have I explained um, what the repository is? Um, have I have I referenced it within? Um, have I referenced my citations within my paper? Do I have everything? It's kind of like your check mark. Um, and what they've demonstrated um, through research is that with these statements, um, you actually have a, a, a more likely to be accurate in what you're reporting. So there's a lot of value here. So don't think of it as any duplication. Think of it as like a summarization. Um, and there's more information at Coptes about about uh, uh, data availability statements. So here's our next poll. This has to do with the data that you're working with right now as a researcher. Yeah, and so the uh, the poll question here is, uh, could you produce the data that you are using for your work right now? Uh, and the options, and you can pick all that apply, are yes, it's in an online slash cloud storage uh, with backup built in. Yes, it's on my laptop right now. Yes, I have it on a thumb drive. No, it's in a safe place, but I'm not sharing it. No, I'm not sure where it is right now. Uh, and I'm going to close the poll up in uh, five seconds. Four, three, two, one. And uh, we're going to share the responses now. So it looks like the, uh, the most prevalent answer was yes, it's in an online slash cloud storage with backup built in. Uh, the next highest was that 40% uh, say they've got it on their laptop, another 9% have it on their thumb drive, 12% uh, have it in a safe place, but they're not sharing it, and 2% uh, are not sure where it is right now. Oh my goodness. Okay, you 2% on the bottom, go figure that out for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's good to see that uh, the, the majority of folks actually have a place where it's safe. Um, 
I, there are countless stories. Um, uh, we at one of the recent student conferences for AGU's fall meeting, there was a story that was shared, and this was just so sad. And I, I want you to not be this person. Um, their field work on paper um, in the back of a car. And this this person's essential life work, right? This is a this is an early career person, and this was this was their study. They they had been gathering this information, and the car caught on fire. Car caught on fire. Now the person is fine, right? But there, I mean, here's their work gone. There were no pictures taken of the of the pages. There was no duplicate of any kind whatsoever. Um, we we I just caution you, please. Um, it, it, you must protect your data. You must take these extra steps. I mean, even if you have your phone and take a picture of the page that you just wrote all your notes on, this is like the most fundamental thing. Don't let it possibly, you know, don't let the dog chew it. Come on, really. I mean, think about these dumb things that happen in our lives where if you just had, you know, dot, 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 you would not have to, you know, I, you know, my backups haven't been running in two months. Do you think I'm at risk? Oh my gosh, please. I have heard so many hard drive crashes where it's gone and you're like, oh, I knew my backup wasn't working for two months. Oh my gosh, guys, you, you, have, to, you have to do this. Find a tool that does it for you automatically. We don't have to think about it. Okay, moving on. Um, so a little bit more about Coptus. Uh, there. Uh, one of the nice things about doing the data fair at AGU is uh, each year is that we've been able to gather resources and information from the folks that have come and put it into a common location um, where you can access it. And it's really helpful and valuable. Um, so there, that's a, an important resource for you. Um, and, and we are expanding this. Um, uh, later on in the summer, we're intending to expand it to be more helpful for those that are, especially authors, when you're about to put your research out, um, making sure you have uh, software citation examples. So those are things that are coming that we don't quite have yet. But um, uh, so look for that uh, improvement coming forward. And I think that gets us to the bottom of the slide deck. I do have the resources for you as a final slide um, uh, with all the links. So please do take advantage of that. And um, but. Uh, Ready for questions, Nathaniel? Yeah, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch over to my screen because I, I have some of the questions typed up here. Um, but please do uh, go ahead and type in uh, your your own questions. Uh, I'm gonna go through what I have so far. Uh, the first one, uh, I'm concerned that my lab is practicing fair data practices. I think that's a uh, concern that their lab isn't practicing fair data practices. How should I go about raising that issue with my advisor or supervisor? Uh, yeah, this is um, th this is actually sadly not a not an uncommon question. Um, you know, what my data management practices I know aren't as good as they should be. Uh, the folks at my lab, um, they, they there isn't one person necessarily assigned to make sure the practices are common. Um, so so. Um, there's caution here, right? You you want to be able to improve what's happening within your lab, within your environment, but you also you also have to do it knowing that um, this is a larger community, and and sometimes uh, a culture change like implementing fair practices can take a little bit of time. So I think what I would start to do is um, take a look at the Nature article where the fair practices are defined um, fairly well, and I would start to ask maybe on a few of them, maybe depending on who your advisor is, you can give the whole article and say, hey, this is in the news and we need to move this way. Or maybe you need to piece out a few of them to say, you know, I think we need best practices along these lines. Wouldn't it be better um, for us to document our data in a common way um, using some standards from the lab so that we're all not asking questions about how to do this? we could single up in a Google Drive or whatever tool is being used, and, and you could come at it that way. So um, this is like an organizational change practice. You, sometimes you have to feel it out. Great. All right. Uh, I'm going to jump to the next one here. Oh, and you have a lot. We have, we have uh, 28 minutes, and uh, based on the flurry of questions that have just gone in, we'll probably go all the way to... Uh, <laughs> to that 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 three o'clock mark. Uh, so the next one I'm going to give you is 
Uh, I have a question about publishing. Should I publish the data that I have produced prior to review? What if I need to change the data slightly after a reviewer comments? Uh, can I go into the repository to change it, or is it best practice to publish it after acceptance? In which case, oh, the reference is... wouldn't be there during the review. So it's, it's sort of yeah, circular you know, logic it... situation. <laughs> probably one of the most popular questions because you know do i do all that work to get it preserved and get my doi get my landing page um and then only to find out that my peer review process told me i needed more data i mean you know so so let's go with the fact that you have you have well um uh, uh well designed your research that you likely have the data that you need i would take that as your going in premise the easiest thing to do to keep your publication process as short as possible is to get your data into the repository, work with the repository folks to get it as the way, the way that makes sense for that data type, and get the, um, get the digital object identifier, get the landing page, and then submit your paper along with the appropriate data citation that links to the repository. This is the cleanest process for publication. Okay, now that being said, that's number one. That's what I would go with. Now, if you have a doubt that you actually think it's possible the peer review process could ask you for a data change, it is possible, um, depending on your, um, it is possible nowadays to have a, um, I'm trying to think what data site calls it, it's a draft digital object identifier. You can get like a placeholder where you can get all the work done, but you didn't quite publish the data. It's available, but only behind the scenes, um, and go that direction. Not all repositories can do that, so you would want to ask the repository what's possible. So there's there's a couple different paths. Worst case scenario is you you submit for I don't want to say worst case, but least least preferable scenario is you you submit your publication, but you've not yet engaged a repository for your data. Um, this this means that things are going to take a little longer because they'll hold public likely hold publication until your data is in a repository and published so that they come out at the same time and usually repositories will need a little bit of time to do that so you'll just have to know that the timing won't necessarily be as optimal as it could all right great uh the next one that i'm going to give you is uh and this came about when you had the FAIR acronym up on the screen. Uh, how, how about the importance of secure and long-term curation, uh, guaranteed archival storage for more than 10 years? How important is that? That's a great question. So, so the challenge that many repositories have, especially if they are domain community specific, is they're not funded more than a few years. Um, what they do is they have a plan for should they no longer exist, the data will go here, or they have a, an archival agreement with a larger repository that will take their data. So even if you're working with one of these very community-specific repositories um, and they can't personally guarantee 10 plus years or, you know, we'd really love to see forever, but that forever is a very difficult word when it comes to funding, um, that they usually have an agreement. And you can ask these questions. Um, you know, can you tell me what your archival long-term preservation uh, plan is? And it, and it likely should have a larger, um, usually they're government-funded repositories or um, fairly stable repositories they have an agreement with. Or, or for instance, um, oh, let me, let me highlight data one. Um, data one has member nodes and they use their member nodes to actually back up each other's data. So if your repository is a data one member node, that's already built into how they do um, business, which is fantastic. So it's, yes, you wanna pick a repository that has a long-term curation, archival plan, methodology, but it doesn't necessarily have to have it on its own. It can work with others. Okay, great. Um... So the next question that I'm going to throw towards you, uh, there's quite a few about funding. So I'm, I'm going to start with uh, a much more higher level one and then move to one that I think is more, a little bit less. Um, so the first one, data curation and data sharing are great ideals, but are often unfunded or underfunded by agencies and or institutions. 
both in terms of hardware and people. How do we get our funders to supply the money to do these things? Oh, could hug whoever you are. Um, so one of the things that by highlighting the importance of data sharing, by highlighting the importance of well-documented data, um, our very complex ecosystem, we're, we're, we're getting in front of funders um, to help them see that the community is, it, is behind this. It doesn't mean that all the pieces of the community are walking in the same direction just yet, but we, we have to keep heading that way. Um, and that means that not quite all the pieces for all domains are at the same level at the same time. So we do best effort. Okay, so for instance, um, let's say you're working on, and I'm, I'm not gonna make this up uh, because you'll, um, uh, we'll just have some sort of a, a concept here. You're working on science where this particular data does not have a domain or community repository to work with. You've done your very best you can't figure it out, um, and uh, you need to find a repository. So there are general repositories out there that in, in that case where there's, you're not able to find curation help that can get you through a lot of these hurdles, do your best. Um, Dryad, Figshare, Zenodo, um, the Center for Open Science is one of the largest data repositories out there. Um, these are folks that have a place for you to put things, but they don't necessarily have as much curation support um, uh, as, as other repositories have. Um, so do your best on getting your metadata there. Um, and this, this would be uh, an interim solution. Now, that being said, what we're trying to do is figure out which communities, um, and, and when, I, when I mean we, um, uh, 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 informatics community AGU is trying to figure out who doesn't have this curation help. Where are we missing the resources that help our researchers? And we are lifting that up. We are having very honest conversations with um, internationally. This is not just the United States, it's internationally. Um, where can we actually get some support uh, for researchers that don't have those that can help us with curation? This is ongoing. We're not gonna be able to fix this real quickly, but it's a best effort till we can continue. Okay, so I think you, you you might have slid the answer to this one in that very, very long and dense answer. Um, but uh, Alejandro wants to know, is, is there a free or affordable repositories that you could recommend uh, that us where we can save data, for example, data from a PhD thesis? Um, Yes, um, I don't have the cost memorized, but Nathaniel, let me give you. Uh, there's a, uh, a uh, there are there are uh, comparative um, blog posts out there that show you um, uh, some of the general repositories that are out there and available. Um, uh, also, um, depending on who your funder is, it's possible that your data management support is built into your grant. You said your PhD study, so that it's also possible that your institutional repository would have, even have a repository that is fair compliant. This is new a little bit for institutional repositories, um, so not all of them are able to, but some are. Some are fantastic, actually. Um, uh, so. So, uh, and that tool, oh, very good. That tool that's coming out in August will help here um, as well. Okay, great. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll make sure, uh, I'll touch base with you after this webinar is completed and I'll, uh, we already have the links, uh, the reference handout, but when we send out the, uh, the this recording is available email, I'll include a link to these, uh, the the, the, the comparative price uh, blog that you talked about. Yeah, so I have to find it, but it might take me a minute. <laughs> I'll, I'll find it. <laughs> That's fair, okay. Um, so let's see. Uh, so this one, it, it's, it's a little bit longer, but I, I think that it, it's, good, it's a good question here. Um, so uh, a specific question on numerical model simulation data. If a model simulation produces multiple terabytes of output, is it acceptable to only archive the model source code and any instructions, et cetera, to exactly reproduce the simulations when publishing on these simulation data? Or should we make every attempt to also 
archive the terabyte terabytes of model output. This um, this is a really popular question with the modeling community. Um, here's here's how we look at it. The the when you're doing research specific to models, the data is kind of of a different type. It's not, you're not really, the data's not really what the focus is, it's the model. So what I would say to you is for your specific community, you wanna engage with um, the, uh, the folks that understand what's necessary to evaluate your research. You do not need, um, it is my, uh, my understanding from our editors in chief at AGU that it is not necessary to have the, t the many, many, many runs um, that maybe for your community, and this is really at the editor's determination, so your community's determination, um, perhaps it's the first, middle, last, perhaps it's the pieces that you're writing about in your research, um, but it, it is a much more reasonable um, answer than all. Uh, now, I am not your editor, um, nor am I an expert in your science, so I won't tell you the exact answer but what the, the spirit here is that, yes, you want your model to have a citation. You want to explain the configurations, the, the wonderful research that you did that came up with your, your results. And then enough data where whoever's peer reviewing will be able to evaluate your science. Okay, great. And I think that actually... Uh... I think that that covered Stephen your question as well. Uh, if it if it didn't cover your question, Stephen, uh, if, if you could clarify it a little bit more, I'm going to move to uh, the next question. Uh, my lab produces a lot of data. We make that public with assigned DOIs. How could I track the publication impact of my lab's data, i.e., how to track down the citations of my data DOI? Um. Uh, I know there's tools to do this. They're, the exact tools are not on the tip of my tongue. Um, uh, so, so Nathaniel, I'm going to have to, uh, you'll have to give me a minute to look that up really quickly. I, I, there is an answer. What I can share with you um, is that that is, um, in some cases, it's a little manual right now, but there, that's being corrected. The community is actually um, connecting the infrastructure so that it's much easier for um, for that credit and um, uh, uh, to be identified. Uh, for instance, there is a, uh, a new, uh, 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 if, you, if you don't know Research Data Alliance or in an international group and they have a, um, uh, uh, I don't remember, it was an, I, an interest group, a working group that, uh, called Scholix. And what Scholix is, is it identifies reuse of data sets in other publications. The the first time a data set is put into the credit infrastructure, so the Crossref, Data Site, um, ORCID, and the repositories, the first time it goes through, it's easy to connect it to the publication because it's usually introduced through the publication together. The second time that data set is used, it's harder to identify um, reuse. And what and Scholix is is uh, it's fairly new, but it creates the environment to connect all of that together. So um, I know there's tools out there to actually track it. Um, uh, I know re some repositories do that for you. They actually go hunt through the literature, um, but Scholix specifically um, will help the publishers and repositories and provide tools to show where things have been cited and used, and then that'll connect into ORCID. So uh, we actually have uh, some suggestions, I think, for the answer to this from the audience. Uh, John nice. Pollock says, uh, data citation index from Web of Science. Does that ring bells to you? Yeah, yeah, thanks, John. Yeah. Okay, all right. And, yeah, I was I could say, it looked like it was the answer you were trying to get to. Uh, I, and so. I think there's other places too. Like I said, it's not, it's not well designed yet. Our infrastructure isn't well designed to get that. First of all, um, uh, oh, here's a great metric for you to kind of get a sense for it. So PLOS One, to, uh, tr they require data on every publication, but they don't require it necessarily in a repository. So there are 20, 
it's 2017, I think this is 2017 metrics, of all of the publications for PLOS One, only 20% of them, the data was in a repository. So consider the fact that that's really the citation you want. You want it out of the repository because that actually shows reuse of your data really nicely. Um, and so uh, as we move towards uh, getting your data into a repository and having it cited and getting credit to you, um, that will actually improve uh, 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 that reuse to actually come your direction and demonstrate the value of your data. Great. All right, uh, so I have a few more questions here. Uh, I'm gonna completely switch gears. I'm not sure if this is the sort of question you normally get, but I, I think it's an interesting one. Uh, and maybe you don't have an answer for it right now, and it's more of a maybe future data management <laughs> webinar discussion. Uh, but the question is, how can companies that provide scientific instrument, instrumentation slash sensors, et cetera, make things easier for researchers to uh, share their data according to you know, fair principles? Yes. Um, this is something that I hear on the edges of my conversations. Um, it is, I, I know there's an awful lot of cutting and pasting happening um, from instrument proprietary instrumentation formats into something that you can actually use and share. Um, and there's, you know, problems, all kinds of problems with that. Um, I, uh, I am aware of groups that are trying to do this. Um, I'm, I'm not certain where they are status-wise, but I know this is, uh, that's the beginning of the generation of data is coming straight off the instrument. Um, in some cases, for instance, I'm thinking of um, like if you're on a cruise and the instruments are, you know, with the with the with the ship, um, they have done a little bit better job in getting that data off and into, for instance, the rolling deck to repository um, database for cruise information. Some of that has helped highlight that value. Um, but yes, I I think we're going to have to keep that one, um, you know, raise that up uh, additionally. Um, I don't think that's got a good answer yet. Okay, great. Well, we'll, uh, we'll look forward to that later on in the year or maybe next year even. Or fall uh, meeting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, more, more we'll like see. next year and beyond, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, it's at least on our radar. <laughs> um, yeah, it, 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 literally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. All right. Um, let's see. I know I saw one more in here that was a good question. Uh, I mean, they're all good questions, but one that was still unanswered um, let's see oh here if an author would like to upload data for a paper that has already been published like let's say five years ago what options are available and what would you recommend I guess this is kind of like how are like it's great to have the uh, fair data principles for research and data going forward but how are we going to deal with that backlog that Another actually very common question I've heard. Um, so at AGU, um, if you have published something many years ago and now you want to connect your publication to a data citation because you've just put your data in an actual repository, it's handled through a correction. Um, how that proliferates through all of the systems, uh, I, I don't think that's been uh, considered yet. Like for instance, your original publication would have moved through Crossref and Datacite and, and uh, populated all of the um, search tools and, and all of the publisher tools out there, but a correction isn't always, doesn't always trigger that. Um, so your digital version may have that citation there, but it may not hit all of the search criteria. So this is, this is a great thing um, for us to continue to highlight to publishers that um, as we are embracing FAIR and you want to now get your data into a repository and link it to your publication, we need easy ways to do that. So, so Nathaniel, actually that's something we can, we can highlight and maybe even that would be good for a fall meeting to see if we could talk to publishers and have some standards there. Okay, great, great. Yeah, that would All be right, good. So, uh, I have, I think, one more question here uh, and, and you might not have an answer or, or an official answer 
So, uh, you know, if, if that is the case, feel free to pass. Um, I, I had a feeling this question might come up, but I, I didn't I didn't warn you that. <laughs> uh, so uh, the question is regarding uh, the recently released uh, Secret Science Act from EPA uh, yeah. and reproducible and open data. Uh, he's read that uh, the rule would exclude research that is vital to inform decision making, like research that contains private personal information, uh, large scale health studies. What are your thoughts about the archiving of this sort of data? I, I, I have some serious thoughts here. AGU, um, if they haven't yet responded, they will. Um, th the reality here is not all data can be open. We have to acknowledge that there's protected data and sensitive data that we do have to protect. Um, you have to, um, uh, some data you can't get access to unless you get approval through an IRB. Um, uh, some of it's uh, secure sensitive, so the folks, folks that work with energy and defense, there's even more restrictions. That doesn't mean that data isn't incredibly valuable to our civilization in making decisions. Uh, it is valuable. So we have processes in place. Um, just because it's not open to you and me and Nathaniel doesn't mean that you discount the value of that research to help make a decision. Um, AGU is responding to that in, in those in that frame. Um, you know, really important research is based on data that's not necessarily open or can be open, um, and we we can't discount it. It's critical. Um, uh, we we need to just you know respect the fact that folks that can get access can look at it, can evaluate the science, have done so, and those decisions are being made. Um, uh, in a in a you know a way that that we can count on, um, so 100% open. That's not the right answer. As much as open as possible, as closed as necessary. Um, much of Earth-based science and environmental data can be open, but when it can't, then you have to be able to account for that as well. Okay, great. Um, and uh, another one that came uh, at the tail end of that. Um, for these situations, uh, oh, and also <laughs> the person who asked the question says that he agrees totally with your assessment. Um, another another attendee says, uh, in these sorts of situations, can you create synthetic synthetic data with the same properties as restricted data for any kind of data sets, uh, and is this commonly done? Wow. Um, I, I will share with you a story, not an answer. Um, I was attending the data ethics uh, uh, symposium at the National Academies about two months ago. And there was a briefing being done by uh, one of the scientists at the, um, the census, the US census. There has been real challenge on how do you provide as much data from the census as possible without um, uh, being able to identify individuals on a street, right? Um, so the past methods were not optimal. Uh, I, uh, I do have a math degree, but I, I, I don't feel qualified at all to, to weigh in on how the US Census has done this. The fellow who um, was standing in front of us briefing was talking about a methodology that was incredibly complex that um, I'm trying to remember some of the words that he used and it's probably best that I don't, um, but he, there's a new method where you introduce a level of noise so that you can in fact share quite a lot of data and it will still perform the way it needs to perform for the census, but you're protecting the person who lives on a street and there's only one house. Um, and the way this is done, um, I, I, like they'll be able to share the data, but they won't be able to share the algorithm that will have to be protected. Um, so I would say that we'll, that perhaps this kind of technique is something that can be adopted in other spaces, but uh, it's definitely not easy. It is complex. So, per, you know, maybe we'll see how, what happens at the US Census, because that's, now a couple years um, they're getting it prepared for the for the next census so i'm sure there'll be publication on that all right great well 
Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, everybody that came. Uh, we've reached the three o'clock mark. Um, we uh, hope to see you again at our uh, upcoming webinars. Uh, and thank you uh, for the presentation, Shelley. Thank you. I'm delighted. All right. Have a good one, everyone.